Caught me. I didn't have my Bible all the way to the right page yet. There we go. Now we're ready. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, um, Good morning Jeff. Good morning, Do <laughs> You wait till I start the next sentence. <laughs> Every time. Um, it's, never mind. Anyway, so uh, last year, almost a year ago, almost, about in September, I came and began speaking here. And my first message was about how God wants to give you rest. And it was a message to myself as much as anybody else. Because at the time, uh, life was not very restful. We were going through sort of a white knuckle season. Um, what I mean by that is every time you would write a check for a bill or pay a bill online or especially write your tithe check, you were going, okay. How is this all going to play out? Is it, is it going to work? Is this going to work, God? And um, especially for some reason, I always get attacked whenever I write a tithe check in that kind of season. And they come, they come a lot, and I've had a lot of those checks where you write it down and you, <laughs> you actually mentally do the math. Is that 10%? Is that really 10%? And then you go to your calculator and you go, 10%. oh gosh, it is 10%. Right, And then as you confirm it, you go, okay, God, you said, and you remind him of the thing that he already said in the Bible that was written way before you were born, and that he's got the words that he himself actually said. God knows what he said. He, he has a good memory when it comes to that. And um, if, if there is something that's a great promise about money in the Bible, it's, it's the promise about tithing, that um, – the only time when he says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the blood gates of heaven, right? And bless you upon even what you've already done. You'll make it all back. Why are you, why are you hesitant about giving it away? And those seasons come a lot. But as soon as I gave that message um, about rest, I began to take that more to heart, actually. I began to pray about it every morning. And as you pray about something every morning, as you begin to as you begin to make that part of your daily routine, all of a sudden God begins to plant the seed of hope in your mind and go, "No, I am going to take care of you. In fact, there will be no time when I will ever, if you adhere to what I said, if that that I will ever leave, that I will ever leave you in a position that you can't get through. In fact, I'm going to take you pretty close to the edge because it's going to grow you." And I'm going to take it sort of like um, sort of like training for anything. I'm going to strip down all that you think about yourself, and I am going to be your coach, and you are going to listen to what I say, and you will become a better player. In fact, you're going to become a better follower of me through this. When you get done with it, you're never going to look back and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have written that tithe check. You're never going to say that because not only have you grown, not only has he grown us here on earth, but it said that, you know, you store up treasures in heaven by doing that. And so later, um, when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, there's going to be a mansion there waiting for you because of how you were faithful to God. And that's never something, I never look back on it and say, I wish I wouldn't have done that. But in the time, before I enter God's rest, and before you make that decision, there's a lot of white knuckling it that goes on. So today we're actually going to explore that again, a year later, but not the same way. We're going to explore that through the Israelites and what they had to go through um, with God. And the fact that every time, I love the Israelites, I think the Israelites are actually a metaphor for us. They were real people, but I do believe in the Bible there's a lot of foreshadowing to the way that we need to live. And the Israelites are a perfect object lesson. They're kind of all carbon copies of me. Whenever something goes wrong, and whenever something begins to challenge the fabric of what they know to be normal, or whenever something gets a little bit uncomfortable and they have to look into the future and go, I don't know what it's going to look like, they turn to God and say, why have you done this? And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, so we're going to go first, actually, to the New Testament. Kind of counterintuitive, I know, it all fits together. Hebrews 3 is where we're actually starting in Hebrews 3, 1 through 19, if you want to go there um, first. While you're going there, um, I love sports, if you haven't already uh, got this. I love sports even that I've never played before. I love watching those because I like learning about them. And I like sitting with people that know more about me um, with sports. I never played football, but I am married into a family that's 
that is just crazy about football, and they've actually taught me a lot more about football than I ever learned, and it's amazing. I love sitting around with them and watching football, except for one fateful game that we won't talk about right now. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so, um, uh, but I also love, um, I love going to a hockey fight, sorry, hockey game, um, because hockey to me is really like, it's like fast paced soccer with razor blades on your feet and sticks. <laughs> Isn't that great? You know, if you ever thought that soccer was boring, you're not alone. I thought that myself, and sometimes I still watch it. And um, if you ever wonder to yourself, wonder if this game could be played way more quickly with, like, way more shoving, and men that didn't, you know, cry like little babies on the field when they got stepped on or something? Hockey is for you. Um, a couple of years, a few years ago, I went with Kaylee to a, a Winter Hawks game, and it was really funny, like, halfway through the game, uh, all of a sudden, someone went up to someone else from the other team, and he said something. Of course, we're way up high, so we don't actually know what was said, but it was something. Maybe like, hey, you look good today. I don't know what I mean. It could have been a good thing. Um, if you ever wanted to, uh, actually, a lot of the NHL fights are actually pretty staged. Uh, if you uh, ever have some time, if you want to go on YouTube, go NHL fights mic'd up. And uh, there are actually mics on these players. They go up to each other, and they say stuff like, you look kind of stupid today. The other player goes like, you want to fight? That's like smiling. They're both smiling. You want to fight? They're like, yeah, okay, good luck. And they actually high five each other before fighting. Um, it just adds to the entertainment, I guess. And so this happened. One player went up to another player, said something, and man, it was as if the floodgates opened. All of a sudden, both bitches jump out. Everybody's pummeling each other, and there's gloves flying, there's sticks flying, there's helmets flying, there's like, I think I saw a skate go across and stuff, and I was thinking, that's actually kind of dangerous. <laughs> but um, it was really funny, and it, it got done. Everybody put on their pads, sorted it out, you know, that's, mine, that's, that's my glove, you know, that's my stick and everything, and then we play the game again, like it just kept going. And uh, that happened a few more times in the game. Hockey is wildly entertaining. Um, one of the most entertaining hockey games that you've ever watched is the 1980 game uh, with the U.S. versus the U.S.S.R., the evil commies, right? That is um, my favorite hockey game. I actually went back, I've, I've gone back, even though I wasn't born back then, I've gone back and I've watched that game, I'm ashamed to say, probably five times. And I can tell you, play by play, what happens. I've also seen the Disney movie Miracle so many times that I could actually recite the entire movie for you right now, which I am not going to do. You're welcome. Um, but in that movie, I love how it actually talks about the two styles of play, right? And uh, years later, after the movie came out, there's actually another documentary uh, by ESPN, one of their 30 for 30 documentaries, that talks about the other side of the coin, because we know what the U.S. went through, right? I don't need to tell you what happened. The U.S. won. Um, it was a bunch of uh, amateur <laughs> hockey players that uh, were facing this uh, very authoritarian, but also much older, much stronger, much more experienced, and professional um, Russian hockey team, even in a day and age when professional athletes were banned from competing in various sports. You weren't supposed to have a professional team um, in the Olympics at that time, but the Russians got around it by saying, hold on, hold on now, these aren't professional players, these are soldiers. We pay them to be soldiers. Well, yes, that's technically correct. They were soldiers, but they were, they were off playing hockey. They got out of soldiering to play hockey. So we know that. We know these different things, and we know the, the outcome of the game. We know that it was the, probably the most hyped up, most anticipated, and most watched hockey game in history. Um, we know that basically it was a clash of two ideologies. Um, the USSR ideology of uh, you know, the idealistic communist versus the Western ideology of a, a democratic republic. We know that it became way more than a hockey game. In fact, the announcers actually said at the beginning of the game, um, for those of you, a lot of you are tuning in that haven't actually seen a hockey match before, um, but this is more than a hockey match. The ticket value outside the stadium was as much as five times what someone would have paid to get in if they had just bought tickets ahead of time. They were exchanging hands at five times the amount uh, that you would have just gone to the box office and paid for them. We know all this, we've heard all of this. You probably are thinking, okay, Jeff, get to your point. What the point is, is that this had never been done before, and I mean Russia, I don't mean the US. The Russians, th this was not their game. Hockey was not their thing. Um, in fact, hockey was invented in Canada, 
And the Canadians had owned the game for just generations upon generations as they, as they had advanced in how to play the game. But the game was very straightforward, right? Ice. Two goals. Men on the ice. And they all wear skates, right? It's a very simple game. You have to put the puck into the goal. But you see, there's also very forward positions. Um, there are a couple positions actually called forward. There's a couple positions called mid. And there are a couple defenders. There's basically, you don't move from these positions. You advance across the ice, but the defenders defend. The people in the middle kind of attack around the middle of the ice. And the forwards attack the goal. That is how you play the game, for crying out loud. The Russians, when they started uh, getting into hockey, yes, they were Soviets, yes, they were communists, yes, they uh, wanted to pump as much money into this program as, as, as they could, because if they were going to do anything, they were going to be the very best at it. But they also, to their credit, rethought the game. They thought to themselves, OK, why does, for example, a defender need to stay behind the rest of the players? What if they moved around? Okay. Um, what if they moved around on offense, but as well as on defense? What if all of the positions are nailed down, but interchangeable? Meaning, if someone attacks you, then you kind of just hold your ground the way that you usually would, right? But if you're attacking the other goal, a defender can score, a mid can score, and a forward can score. And although your objective is to get it to the forwards, what if the forwards didn't just stand there? Because previously, that's how it worked, right? The Canadian forwards would just stand there, waiting for the puck. Meanwhile, their man would be right across from them, waiting to try and stop them. That's how you played the game. Why would you play it any different? The Russians said, okay, what if our forwards continuously circled around the opponent's goal? That way, they were always moving. That way, you couldn't, as a defender, go, eh, well, you know, Jeff is not the best hockey player, so we're going to cheat off him a little bit and go toward this other guy that we're pretty sure they're going to pass to. That was usually how you played the game. Uh, the Russians kind of went, we'll have two forwards that we know we can pass to both of them, and also they're constantly going to be circling the goal behind the goal so that you need to watch each of them at all times. Not only do you need to watch each of them at all times, though, let's say you do that really well, the defenders can also score. They're also trained scorers. And so if they advance it up the ice, you're now going to have to stop them too. You're also going to have to stop the midfield players because they can also attack the goal. You see how hard this could be to stop? The Soviets took that. It could sound like chaos if you didn't know how to do this. The Soviets found out how to drill this over and over and over again to perfection, and they began to run over teams. Uh, in, 19, in the late 1970s, the U.S. finally went, okay, okay, we have to settle something. The U.S. and Canada said this. Um, we need to settle who's the greatest hockey superpower in the world. So they did what, you know, the U.S. and Canada usually do. They took all the best players and put them on the same team, called an all-star team. We're really all about all-star teams. And so they took all the best players, put them all on the same team, and uh, they, they uh, had two matches, or two series of matches, the NHL All-Stars versus the Russians. And the Russians destroyed them. Because the Russians weren't all about themselves. All-Stars are kind of all about themselves. They all want to have their stats. The Russians didn't care. The Russians also had this new style of play. Fast forward to 1980, where um, a guy named Herb, who uh, won one national championship, is trying to get a bunch of kids that are barely over the age of 22 to play against these mid-30s, wildly experienced and wildly more professional um, uh, Russian team in the Olympics. They actually met them for the first time and got destroyed again. I think it was 12 that got actually just wiped off the map. And there was really no way that the U.S. was going to beat these men in the Olympics. But Herb sat down with his team, and he said to them, Look, when you come into this game against the Russians the next time, I want you to forget do to do what you did last time, which is what, what they were doing was they actually looked at them and went, They're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger, they have this new style of play, that they're just, they're better in every way. Herb said, First of all, they're not better than you. You are actually as well trained as they are. I've made sure of that. The second thing he told these young men is he said, 
we're going to drill the same style of play as the Russians, and we're going to do it better than the Russians. What he actually found out, what Herb found out, is that you can do the same thing where all your players move and attack at the same time. You can do the same thing on defense. So now when the puck is advanced down to your side of the ice, not only do your defenders defend and everybody else stand around, no, everybody else will now not stand around. Everybody will now all defend as one unit with the goal of scoring on the other side of the ice, meaning everything is an attack. You're never defending. And this took the Russians a second to grab hold of. And actually, when the U.S. trusted in this style of play, when the U.S. finally said, this will work for us, they began to be the most unbeatable team in the world. And for just a minute, they were the best team that the world had ever seen compete at the game of hockey. Really interesting how that happens, right? When you put your trust absolutely in the thing that you need to trust in, it just works. In fact, you begin to relax and you begin to rest. How does this apply to the Bible? Well, Hebrews 3. I'm actually going to fast forward. No, I'm not. Never mind. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Let's start at verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in this heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So, as the Holy Spirit says, this is the most important thing today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. During the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for forty years they saw what I did, this is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are going, are always going astray, and they have not known my way. So I declare an oath on my anger, they shall never enter my rest. The last part is sort of condemning. They will never enter my rest. Why would they never enter God's rest? See, first of all, he's talking about the Israelites, and we'll go into that story in a second, too. If you want to find that story, um, that's actually in Numbers 13. Numbers 13. I'm starting right at verse 1. Numbers 13. That's where we're going. Um, but what he's actually talking about in the past was where the Israelites had so many chances to trust God, and they saw so many signs and wonders um, that, that kind of compel them they should trust God, but then when it came to actually doing business, when it came to taking down the Canaanites and getting that promised land, they didn't get there. In fact, they actually sat back and they said, those men are bigger than I am. Let's review what they actually saw. So if you're not familiar with the story, or it's been a while, I understand it's been a while, this is, to this point, as we, as we sit in the book of Numbers, this is actually where um, uh, the Israelites are and what they've seen. First of all, they've seen an angel of God, a pillar of fire and cloud, guarding them, Exodus 13. They escaped from Egypt, also in Exodus. They saw the Red Sea parted in Exodus 14. Um, this was 200 miles, by the way, after <coughs> leaving Egypt. So 200 miles after leaving Egypt, they've been hiking for 200 miles already. That's quite a ways, because they're not driving in the car, they're hiking. All of a sudden, Pharaoh shows up. And you can imagine now being really tired and being in the wilderness of Egypt. The place that they were at was actually in the middle of the desert in Egypt. So they probably haven't had a lot of water in a while. Uh, provisions are probably running a little short as they reach the sea. And on the horizon, you see the entire Egyptian army. And the Egyptian army was one of the great powers in the world at that time. And you think, these men are trained to pursue and kill me. Except the fact that the entire Egyptian army drowned at the bottom of the ocean, and, or at the bottom of the sea in Exodus 14. So God actually says, eh, no, and wipes them off the face of the map. The Israelites have already seen this happen. They've already seen God deliver in these circumstances. But it goes on. Um, they encountered some bitter water, uh, not fit to drink, um, in Exodus 15, and God made them drinkable. 
a big saw bread come down from heaven, followed by quail shortly after. Also in Exodus 15, Moses raises his hand to help the Israelites defeat Amalek in Exodus 17. Um, in fact, one time, um, the uh, Israelites actually got angry with Moses and angry with God and said, we have no water to drink. God says, okay, Moses, take your staff and hit this rock and water will come out of it. That was in Exodus uh, 17. They've seen so much, but yet still have so little faith. They are me. The Israel, I love the Israelites. They are me. But God has a warning for me. Because as I've seen him help me so many times, and I've seen him make something out of nothing so many times, there comes a time when it is time to trust in God. So Numbers 13 starts like this. They're about to enter Canaan, by the way. Canaan is the promised land. Uh, currently, and I did a lot of research on this, this is pretty convoluted and there's, there's varying theories on this. I would show you a map, in fact I had one ready, but it's also very confusing. From what we know, they were approximately 150 miles away from the promised land at this point. It was right over a ridge and then you would reach the Canaanites. But about 75 miles away are actually some hill-dwelling Canaanites, too, that could also give you some trouble if you try to enter their land. So this is what happened. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of, it, of each of its leaders. And the next part is, of course, a big old list of all the dudes that he sent. Uh, if you want to read that on your own time, that's great. I'm not going to read it right now because that's a, it's a big laundry list of people. These guys were not only tasked for um, getting and, and scoping out the area, but they were tasked. It doesn't say explore the hill lands of Canaan. It actually says, you know, go into Canaan, right? So I'm thinking they actually hiked 150 miles to Canaan, checked the entire scene out, hiked back 150 miles. That's that's what most uh, experts think that they probably did. These men come back after hiking 300 miles, and they have a grim report to give. I'm skipping to 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he says, Go up through the Negev and onto the hill country. See what, see what that land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit from the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. They have a lot of things they need to do, right? They need to infiltrate and come back with the report. In 21, it says this. So they went up and explored the land from the desert, Zin as far as Rehob, toward Labo Hamath. So they went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahim, Sashai, and Telmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they had reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. Nowhere in there does it say they encountered some bad stuff, right? It kind of just gives a, uh, it gives just a layout of they, they cut off some vegetation, they found that things were, you know, okay, and they were starting to come back. 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went to the land to which you sent us, and it does not flow with milk and honey. So they came back and actually to told Moses, hey, so you're God that you, that you said, you know, needed, he was going to give us a land of milk and honey. Found no milk and honey. There's no biscuits over there. I mean, there's nothing to put milk and honey with. There's, nothing is going to be easy, basically, is what they said. Uh, it does flow. It does flow. Did they say it does? Yeah. Verse 27, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Then I'm, I'm referring to the next part. Here's the fruit, but... Sorry, thank you, thank you. <laughs> that's why we have open Bibles. Thank you, that, that's why we do. Thanks for checking. <laughs> it does flow with milk and honey. Thank you. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. 
We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live there in the land along the Jordan. <coughs> then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Caleb's a man of God. Caleb knows, look, we've done this laundry list of things that God's actually shown us. We can do this, um, but we just need to actually go and do it like God told us to. I don't know why we even tried to survey this. We can, we can go do it right now. But the men who had gone said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anakom from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So not only do they come and talk to the leadership, they also spread dissension among the Israelites because they kind of just, they go and tell them, look, this is, this is not going to happen. We, we can't go and do this. But the deal with God is that he will never give you something that's easy enough for you to do alone. It just doesn't happen. And I think there's a good reason for that throughout the Bible is that if we were able to do things alone, we wouldn't need an all-powerful God. For example, if you have complete control over your finances and you thought, you know, nothing is going to happen to me, uh, moth and rust will not destroy anything of mine, you wouldn't need an all-powerful God to come and save you. If you could actually live a perfect life and you could actually do all the things that are needed for you to never sin, you wouldn't need a perfect Savior who was perfect among us and died and then rose again on the third day. You wouldn't need it, right? Because we've got this ourselves. If the Israelites really could have escaped from Egypt, they probably would have done it, right? They probably would have just thrown off the shackles of, their, of the people that have bound them for centuries and actually just escaped into the desert themselves, wouldn't they? But no, they needed an all-powerful God. Um, I was listening to a, a pastor once at uh, Canby Christian Church's Faith Lib, the guy that um, uh, spoke with uh, a few more famous people than me, but also toured the country speaking as well. And he said this, I love this. Um, he said, God is so loving that he didn't just give us a book of rules. He gave us a love story. The entire Bible is a love letter written to you and me. And in that love letter, it's a love letter about a God who is perfect, who is sinless, and who is blameless, but loves an imperfect and sinful people so much that he's willing to do whatever it takes. And that's the perfect message of who God is. I love that because if we had a if we had a perfect life, if we had it all together, we wouldn't need an absolutely perfect God. And the Israelites needed a perfect God. In Numbers 14, verse 1, it goes starts like this: the people rebel. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. You know how many times they say that? I did the research. The Israelites will say that four times. From, those, from when they start in Egypt to when they actually get to this point, I counted four times. Four times they actually say something to be effective. If only we had stayed in Egypt. If only we hadn't gone with you, Moses. Or only, if only we had died in Egypt. If only we had just not not gone on this journey. Things would have been so much better, right? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought, you know, how crazy God, uh, Moses is God's ambassador, but yet the people come to him and say, if only we hadn't done what you said. It's kind of like saying to God, if only I hadn't listened to you. But they feel a little better about it, right? Because they're talking to Moses. So it's a little bit better. Um, something that we could take from that, not actually part of this entire message, but have you ever seen someone go up to a pastor and complain about something to their face. I haven't either, actually. I, I haven't at all. But pastors are some of the people that we love to talk about. In fact, that's why I keep saying I'm a teacher, not a pastor. <laughs> because pastors are some of the most accused, condemned, and talked about guys that I've, I've never heard of next to politicians, really. And I think some, to some extent, some of the time, pastors are imperfect people. Pastors are just guys that, you know, are called by God to complete a task. 
And so there is some sin in there. There is some selfishness in there. And I have, I have heard and met a few pastors that may have deserved some of the things that were said about them. But I think if you're going to take anything away from um, what was said with the Israelites here, you kind of have to go, it's kind of a problem if someone is chosen by God to do something. They're completing that task. And then there's a lot of dissension against them, and there's a lot of talk being talked about them. That kind of signifies a lot of worry for me, because if someone has been appointed by God to make these certain decisions, even if there's a decision that you're going, uh, I don't know if that's right, these people are appointed by God. That is almost sacred territory right there. Anyway. So the people rebel against Moses, because in Moses and Aaron, because it's, it's really hard to rebel against God. You don't want to say, why have you done this? It's, it's way more socially acceptable to rebel against these two guys. Where am I? Oh, there we go. If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? There it is again. They said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. First of all, that's a horrible plan, right? Going back to Egypt, you realize that you just killed the entire Egyptian army? That's a terrible plan. I don't know who said that, but I'm glad they didn't mention it because, whoa. <laughs> That's a terrible plan. Go back to Egypt where we killed the entire army and disgraced the leader of Egypt? Okay. Anyway, after, what, after this happens, um, a few things happen. God becomes angry. And if you want to read the story uh, alone or by yourself, you can. Um, it's going to take me a little bit of time to read it uh, here. So here's the play-by-play. God gets angry. He curses them with 40 years of wandering in the desert. You know where? About 75 to 150 miles away from the land that they actually would have made it into. In fact, they are so lost that they actually don't know where they are and just circle that land for 40 years until that entire generation, except for a few people, dies off. It's crazy. If you look at a map, there's no way... To, to say to someone, this happened, but there is no God. Because anyone that could have navigated anywhere knows where north is. And northwest of them is Canaan. All they had to do was go northwest, and they would enter that land. But no, they couldn't get there. So not only does this happen, but the Israelites say, we're going to do this alone, even though God has already cursed us. The curse gets handed down, and they say, it's okay. We can go. Um, maybe, God will, maybe God will like us again if we go. God never stopped loving them, but they actually think, we can actually do this. We can go against what God has said is going to happen. Moses warns them against it. He says it's not going to happen. You guys can go if you'd like. The people go to the hill country of Canaan anyway, and they get slaughtered by lesser numbers, lesser forces, and a ragtag group of militia that are hiding out in the woods. They get slaughtered so bad that they are beaten back about 70 miles from where they were in the hill country. They get beaten back about 70 miles back into the same desert that they started from and wandered again for 40 years. There's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a warning in there, isn't there? There's been many times in my life where I've white knuckled decisions. There's been many times in my life where I've kind of gone, I can do this myself. And as cliche as it sounds, there's many times in my life where I've actually gone to God and I've said, why have you done this when I haven't been faithful? My One of my favorite movies is uh, Where the Red Fern Grows. Before you groan, I, I know, I know it's, it's sad at the end. Uh, if you watch it, don't worry, nothing, nobody's going to die before the end, especially not the two characters you love most. Um, but I love this movie because it has a really great message in the middle. This little boy wants to buy two dogs. All he wants to do is go hunting with his two dogs. And he goes to his grandpa, who's the owner of the store, and his grandpa says, well, dogs are a lot of money. You're going to have to work for them. And the boy goes, as much, I, I have to work for so many years, Grandpa, to buy these dogs. And his grandpa says something really interesting. His grandpa says, his name is Billy. Billy, um, you'll get those dogs if you work for them and you pray about it. But here's the deal. you got to meet God that way. You can pray about it. You'll get those dogs. God will provide you with enough work that you will have more than enough money. He ends up with more than enough money. He gets a, he gets a little bit of a refund 
uh, because he pays too much for the dogs. But you'll have more than enough money to buy these dogs. In fact, you're going to be wildly successful with these dogs. He becomes one of the best coon hunters in the whole county with these dogs. But you've got to meet God halfway. Then you can enter his rest. The reason the Israelites couldn't enter God's rest is they didn't meet God halfway. They were all there. Everything was ready. God set them up with a perfect victory. All they had to do was take it, but they couldn't trust it. They couldn't trust it. If you're like me, and you've been there before, that's a hopeful thing. It's not a condemning thing. That's hope. That's hope right there. That God can take care of it. Whatever it is, God can take care of things financially. God can take care of the smallest thing you've got. Uh, it's your friendship, uh, at, your, uh, at your school, at your job. God can solve anything that you can possibly think of. But you have to come halfway. You have to ask. And you have to hold on to those promises that he said. I talked about today financially. There's many other areas of my life where I'm still trying to do that. I'm still trying to... Lean completely on the love of God that he's going to give me through. And I'm still, this is, this is a work in progress. But I think it's a message of hope, don't you? That if you trust in him, he'll get you over that hill country. It's kind of funny that, the, that it's kind of a metaphor, right? The hill country. He'll get you over the hill country into the promised land, and you're going to find rest in him. So trust. Let's pray. God, I ask you for patience. I ask you for kindness, and I ask you for trust. I ask you for trust in you, and I ask you uh, that you would uh, help me to trust the people that you've placed in my life to help me out with things, God. You've placed so many people in my life to give me direction, to give me hope, and to um, provide me with the things that I need, God, but I just need to trust that your promises are true. I need to trust that your time is, is correct, that you want us to do that. And I need you to, I need to trust in you that you will carry me to the promised land every day. Thank you for rest.